um, if I was to only in a world where I was only allowed to do one, I think I would. Oh man, that's hard. I would, I would, I would probably, I'd probably still say, oh man. <laughs> uh, I think writing. I think I would, I would choose writing, even though in the moment performance, there's kind, there's like very few feelings that you'll ever have. You know, I, I or in my experience as you know a person, as you will have kind of losing yourself in a character. Applause is a, probably the most addicting thing you'll ever experience to have a crowd a, a applaud you. Is um, you know, I couldn't. I, I that's the that's the pinnacle of like human existence in, in my in my world is is applause. Um, but there's something about writing that is a more kind of pure expression of maybe what's inside my soul where I get such a greater um, long-term feedback, I guess. I want to welcome you to another episode of Media from the Heart. My name is Ruth Hill and I'm your host. And today I am thrilled to bring you yet another fantastic actor. He's Canadian. His name is Ryan Bruce and more than likely you've seen him in something whether it's Hallmark or another network show, um, all over the place, lots of different things, Canadian programming as well as US programming. So I would invite you to listen to this young man, such a captivating presence on screen. And while we won't see, well, we in the United States won't see him in a new Christmas movie this year, there's plenty of things to watch him in so but but let's go beyond that and that's what i love about this particular um podcast episode all my podcasts we go deeper and we go deep with mr ryan bruce so sit back enjoy and i as i present to you mr ryan bruce well, i want to welcome you to another episode of media from the heart my name is ruth hill and i'm your host and today I have another exceptionally talented, gifted human being who is my very special guest, Ryan Bruce. Very nice to meet you. It's great. Nice to meet you as well. Thanks for having me. Well, my pleasure. I'm glad it worked out. Now, some of you may not be familiar with him. I have a feeling once we get into this conversation, you might find out that you actually have seen him in some things. That's what I've discovered. I've seen him. In, actually, I'm very familiar with some of his works in the past. But I wanted to read just a little bit to introduce Ryan to you in case you're not sure who he is. Ryan Bruce was born and raised in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. His training started in the theater department at the University of Saskatchewan. He then moved into film and television at the Vancouver Film School and has completed the CBC Actors Conservatory program at the Canadian Film Center in Toronto. He is an actor and a writer, but has also jumped behind the camera to direct and produce. And so I realize that's a small, but that's a good way to introduce you. And actually, I want to talk about um, Saskatch Saskatchewan. I've actually have come in contact with several actors over the past few years who that's where they're from and really? oh yeah yeah it, it's kind of interesting i i'm it seems like there is um maybe not a i don't know if it's a major film center now i don't I, mean, I know it's grown a lot but it does seem like there are several people who are from that area so what was that like then growing up in uh, i I'm, I'm not familiar with that part of Canada. I've really I've actually mm -hmm. never been to, I've, I've only been to Vancouver and Victoria, British Columbia has been my experience. But what, what was it like growing up in uh, Saskatchewan? What was that area like? Uh, well, for your American listeners, we're right north of North Dakota. So oh, that okay. kind of puts you on the map someplace. So it's, it's quite similar to like the Midwest in the States when I've been down there, um, culturally speaking, for sure. Like it's, more of a rural, uh, hard nosed, you know, work t work, you know, from dawn to dust type of lifestyle. I'd say for sure. Um, you know, like my family, we settled in Saskatchewan. I guess like right around the early 1900s, where uh, our farmstead was set up. So I come from a 
mainly like a farming background as most people do. And then my dad kind of uh, stepped away from that and he uh, went into the medical profession. And that's kind of like where a lot of my other family have ended up, uh, my sister included. And, and then I'm kind of, you know, the black sheep of the family who went into the arts and had to leave home to do so as many people, you know, from the Midwest have to do, you have to go to the larger urban centers to, to get some opportunities to, to perform on a larger stage. So yeah, that's basically my story of home, but I, you know, I love going back any opportunity I can get, you know, it's like home is, is where the heart is. And, and we still have some land that I farm uh, every July. We do like a hay field type of thing and sell our, sell our bales to uh, some horse breeders that are just outside of Saskatoon. So I love going back and doing that every summer. Oh, well, I'm glad I asked because yeah. you just gave me a nice geography and history lesson. So, so that's yeah. good. I, I love that. Yeah. I love getting to learn those kinds of things. Um, yeah. So since acting was not a part of your family, acting and entertainment and all that, 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 that was not a normal part maybe of your, of, of your growing up experience, then how did you get interested in that? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Like I didn't have any um, artists in my family, except my grandma. She was actually American. She was born and raised in Chicago. And she was a, a dancer who actually used to open up for the three stooges when they would go on tour. Wow. Yeah. So she had kind of a pretty interesting life. And then when she met my grandpa, who was a podiatrist who was training down in Chicago. Cause at that point, like in the thirties and forties, the only podiatry school in North America was in Chicago. So he had gone down there for school and they have kind of a pretty amazing, uh, you know, romance story, but she ended up moving back up to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan with him. I don't know how he convinced her on that, but he did. And, uh, so I guess like I've always had kind of a bit of, um, you know, a connection with, you know, wanting to express myself uh, in a larger capacity than, I guess, kind of like what a lot of other careers could do. I wasn't really aware of that growing up very much just because I didn't have any other people around me who were doing that sort of thing. You know, it's definitely a much more of, um, you know, a community that really puts sports and economics, you know, ahead of artistic pursuits, you know, mostly just because we don't have the economy in Saskatchewan set up that ha that supports an art industry so you know people who are from there often have a hard time understanding that you know an artist can make money and support themselves mm -hmm. in like a proper manner so there is like a fear around you know a child taking on uh, a career as an artist just because you know parents think that they're going to starve and die and you know be dependent and that kind of thing for their whole lives so, like that's a very real fear there just um because they just haven't seen a lot of people succeed at that you know it's not in the community necessarily usually if an artist exists in the community um in those places they uh you know they have another job type of thing and it's kind of looked at as more of a hobby rather than a career so um so i guess it was it was just like by pure luck that when i was going to university I was actually framing houses at the time I used to be like a home builder and in high school I had like done a few theater type things and my friends always were pushing me to do that further just because they liked watching me you know be crazy on stage and that type of thing and I had hired a friend who was a semi-pro hockey player to help me build this house that I was building in the summertime when he was back from playing hockey and he was on uh Kijiji one night and I can't remember what he was looking to buy, but he was just looking to buy some, you know, random old thing cheaply. And he came across an ad for a short film for auditions. So he had just like printed this audition off and brought it to work the next morning. And over the morning of us, you know, working, framing this house, he had convinced me to go do the audition that day. So he had called the producer and director and got me an audition time. And I went into this audition after work and I was like still wearing all my work clothes and dusty and muddy and all that kind of stuff. And I had no idea what I was about uh, to partake in, but it was just like someone's apartment, you know, where they had pushed like all the furniture off to the side and made a mark and set up a camera and that kind of thing. And, and I did the audition and it, it was a story about um, 
a boy who drowns in the river in Saskatoon because Saskatoon has a river that that splits the city and it's kind of the heart of the city. Um, and I auditioned to be the the kid who drowns in in the story. And then, you know, for whatever reason, the director liked my audition and he offered me the role of the lead guy who survives his brother's drowning and then is searching and trying to find him and that kind of thing. So that was my first real opportunity to get in front of the camera. And, you know, once you kind of get that first taste of that type of excitement, it's really hard to decide you're going to do anything else with your life. So he had done that director had actually gone to the Vancouver film school. And after we had finished shooting, he really started to push me in that direction as well. I was like, you should go to this school. You got to go to Saskatoon. You got to go to a bigger place. And uh, I was going to university that fall and I decided to take an acting class there. And I kind of had those same things um, uh, told to me by a lot of the instructors. There. They were also pushing me to kind of pursue it on a bigger, a bigger stage. Um, so it's just really like about people kind of believing in, in you, you know, it's, I didn't ever think that I could go leave home for one. And then also to, you know, be on the TV that would never, never cross my mind. When I was a kid, it was people kind of telling me that I was capable of something like that before I could see myself doing it. And then of course it takes, you know, a number of years of training and, and, uh, getting warm to that idea before you can really own own that place you know it's it's a it's a leap of a leap of faith and like quite a bit of confidence needed to stand in front of 100 people on set and pretend like they're not staring at doing that type of thing so um so yeah it's, it's a process but really i think it all starts with someone telling you that you're capable of doing something someone has to believe in you you know before you can start believing in yourself so i was just lucky at the end of the day that i had people that came into my world and and uh, told me I could do something like that. And they saw something in me, I guess, is kind of what, what had happened. And, and yeah, I'm just forever grateful to those people. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank so. you for sharing all that. That's that was a yeah. fascinating story. Um, I, I always love- A little hearing... long-winded, but- <laughs> No, no, no. Hey, you know what? That's, first of all, it was not boring at all. I, I always okay. think it's- I, I've interviewed enough actors and always say, oh, I'm rambling or, or it's long winded, but, but I yeah. think that you're sharing your passion, you're sharing your story, you're sharing what's very meaningful to you. And while you're thinking, and I, I think we all tend to do this, we think, well, my story isn't really that exciting and nobody wants to hear it because mm -hmm. I think we have, the, it's like, but then when we share it and people can make those connections, like, wow, that's, and, and that's what I love about it's one of the things I love about my podcast and maybe when I was doing interviews before this it's getting the opportunity for people to share their stories because you don't always get that opportunity and I love being able to find the find the people who maybe um maybe you're not the big name shall we say I mean I'm not saying that mm -hmm. I would you know ever turn the interview down if if you know, someone big name I was going to interview, but I do love getting mm -hmm. to interview those that don't always get to be interviewed and spotlighted. So that's why I'm glad that it worked out for uh, for you to come on today. And and I find yeah. your story fascinating. And I'm sure that my listeners will. To my mom's already, I can already hear her <laughs> like, oh yeah, it wasn't boring. She was. It's it's it is fascinating because no one has the same story when it comes to acting I mean, it comes to life in general i know but when it comes to acting sometimes we get into this mindset of well everybody has to do it this way like here's the formula for success to be an actor mm -hmm. you do a b c d it doesn't work that way like it, it's just it just doesn't and so mm -hmm. i love being able to hear the way that you got there and your story is 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 unique and i haven't heard a story quite like that so thank you for sharing um yeah so how did your parents what what, what were your parents and and you said your sister also um what what were what were their thoughts when you decided that you were going to pursue this career um i think like skeptical probably i um you know i've always had very supportive parents my whole life but i don't think that they ever thought i would become uh, an artist 
you know, just because when I was younger, I was, I was quite, you know, busy in sports and that stuff. And I think, you know, my mom probably thought I would be like, a, you know, some sort of high school, you know, uh, you know, lit teacher or something like that, who also coached the basketball team. And you know, that's probably what, what she thought I was going to become or, um, or, you know, when I was doing construction i think my dad really quite he was you know a man who really uh, appreciated people who did things with their hands you know and they made things that were of uh of worth that that you could see you know he really understood understood that type of thing and you know i had a bit of a talent for for woodworking in high school and he you know loved woodworking so he was always pushing me to do that type of thing but um yeah when i told them i was going to go move to vancouver for film school um yeah, I remember it, like sitting around the dinner table with the family, and I think my sisters just kind of started snickering. Like I have two two younger sisters, and they're uh, pretty playful with me to say it, you know, the best way. But they like to give me a hard time and that type of thing, and and um, and they were. And I think my mom was uh, even more apprehensive than my dad was actually, because I think she, you know, she was just worried. She didn't want me to leave home. You know, mom doesn't doesn't want her son to leave. That's kind of you know, how, how the old story works. But I think my dad kind of thought I would go and do the schooling and kind of realize that I want to come back home and do what I was doing before type of thing. Right. Um, so the, I think the big shocker really came for them when I, uh, you know, when I told them that I wasn't going to be coming home after, after that year of, of studying in Vancouver, that, you know, I got an agent and, I had done some things in film school that, you know, were put on camera. And I think I had shown them those videos of short films and it always bothers them when they watch me act because I'm a little bit more of a character actor generally. So it's like a quite a challenge, I think, for someone who knows you personally to see you kind of become a different person. They like it really kind of messes with with their with how they, they see you. You know, they just have such a strong feeling towards who you are in their life. You know, that's my brother, that's my son, that's my whatever. And as soon as they see you, you know, have a weird accent or uh, are behaving erratically, or even sometimes I've played characters that are quite, um, you know, vicious people, mm -hmm. that's really hard for them to kind of take that into their into their system and and and, uh, and not have kind of a, a strong reaction to it, right? So... But on some level, I remember I like we went down to the farm actually because we lived in the city and we went down to like my family farm that my dad was a twin and we went down to visit his twin, his brother, who still is on the family farm. And when we were down there, I showed my uncle the video that I had made at school and my uncle was quite impressed by it and was like very, you know, oh, you should do this. Yeah, you should keep doing this. This is great. And I think my dad seen his brother's reaction to watching me do that. Mm -hmm. That I remember on the drive home, my dad was a very quiet man as well. So it was like, you know, you could do a four hour drive on the highway and he would maybe say three words over like the old, you know, government radio as someone was, you know, droning away all, the whole time. And I remember he just kind of spoke up out of nowhere and was just like, you know, I think you can, you can do this if you want to do this. So um, that was like the first time I really heard him you know, with conviction in his voice, approve of what I was deciding to do, you know, and that was quite a big moment for me, obviously, to, you know, it's like, no matter what we say, I think, um, you know, our parents' approval is just always going to be a huge thing to anybody, you know, it's like, it's a lot of the reason why we, you know, want to be good in life is so that we can live up to, you know, the goodness of our parents, and my, my both my parents are quite um, helpful people to their community, so so uh, I've always strived to kind of fill those big shoes. And um, I hope, you know, with my acting career, I can I can do that as well. And with the things I want to produce in the future and that type of thing. So, yeah, another long winded answer for you. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's no, that was phenomenal. And I loved what you said about uh, you know, talk about your parents. Uh, that was that was great to hear that story, because you're so right that um, I think even, you know, hopefully the majority of people have a basically pretty good relationship with their parents i know it doesn't always happen i, mm -hmm. I know there's there's mm -hmm. there's there could be there could be situations where it's not but mm -hmm. 
but hopefully we all have at least some some semblance of a good relationship with our parents and there is there just is always that thing of it means so much it's it, it's funny when you, uh for for me where i'll interview someone and then i know if i hear if their mom comes back and says that was such a good interview and but it's like the best compliment I could possibly receive because I know how important it is. Yeah. Like your parents are supportive. And so for mm-hmm. the, for the mom to come and say, Oh, you did such a great job. And that was fantastic. And thank you for, then it's like, that means so much. It's great when I hear all the other things, but there's something about those parents. And, and so that's good that um, I love the fact that you have supportive parents, but I can certainly understand the concern going in there, of course, but, but it oh, yeah. sounds, mm-hmm. but, but that, that's good. You, that was, thank you for sharing all that again. That would, that we, we're learning quite a bit about you, Ryan. So, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I know you talked about your, uh, your, the short film that you were first a part of. So mm-hmm. what was the first, like, bigger role or that, 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 that you had the opportunity to, to be a part of? Um, like the one that I kind of remember the most would have been, uh, a show called Blackstone, um, which is like a, was a really interesting show that was shooting up here in Canada. Uh, it was shooting in Edmonton, so in Alberta. And it was a show about, uh, you know, the native community and, uh, I was playing a, a really, uh, like bad person to kind of put, to just to say it honestly, like he was, um, you know, from the wrong side of town and didn't have much respect for for anybody and was, you know, uh, uh, definitely racist and mm-hmm. sexist and like all you know, basically the laundry list of you know what can make a terrible person. And it was a, it was a, uh, I got to do two episodes and the arc for those two episodes was really around my character and this kind of terrible storyline that, you know, is reminiscent of some of the issues up here in Canada with the missing and murdered indigenous women. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was like a really tough uh, storyline to dive into. And that kind of sat with me for a long time after playing that role, just because there is like, you know, a bit of a residual effect that happens, you know, sometimes, you know, when uh, I'm performing, I guess there's like a bit of a disconnect you know, you're, you're doing these actions and your mind is in a space where it's kind of like splitting a a consciousness barrier where, you know, I'm kind of living and breathing and acting as a different person that I've built, but there's still consciousness within me that, that is still myself, you know, where I can pull myself in and out of those moments and that type of thing. But in the after effects, you know, sometimes I'll have like nightmares where it's like, you're living that scene um, but you don't have that disconnect where it's like you can stop it or that you're in control of it, you know. So uh, especially for some of the scenes I had to do in that show, that that was, you know, a, a big moment for me, especially to kind of like really get lost in a character like that and to, also, and to have that the residual effect afterwards where I was trying to, you know, figure out how, what this was doing with my psyche. And, uh, you know, I had like guilt, you know, I would wake up in the, in the middle of the night, you know, sweating and with just these like kind of a panic attack of guilt that I had actually done that thing, you know? So that was definitely the most formative, uh, job where I just learned so much about what, you know, acting could actually be and what it could actually mean. And not only for myself, but also like getting to work with, with that community specifically and have them, you know, receive me so warmly and, and, uh, help me tell that story. And then they also, you know, nominated me for awards afterwards and that type of thing. So there was also, they were so appreciative of, of the work I had put into it, which meant, you know, a lot that I could tell or help tell, uh, you know, a powerful and important story. Um, yeah, that just meant, meant the world to me, you know, it felt like I was a part of something that could hopefully, open the conversation on something that people need to be talking about more, you know, and maybe could have some positive change in society. So, so that's the one that I definitely remember as being like that first big step into like, you know, you know, big boy world of acting, right. Yeah. <laughs> Rather yeah. than, uh, 
than some of the smaller roles I had done before, which, you know, every actor kind of starts out with just those one or two lines or, you know, and sometimes they're cut out of the show completely. And, and, you know, you have to go through those kind of disappointments at the beginning too, as well as you kind of learn how the industry is and, you know, uh, how it works and that type of stuff. But yeah, definitely Blackstone. I'm not sure where you can catch it now. I think it was on Netflix for a while. I'm not sure if it was in the States on Netflix, but it was up here on Netflix for a while. But yeah, if you can ever catch that show, it's quite an interesting show. And they have a new one now that's called Tribal, which has more oh. to do with yeah, yeah a police it. politics. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, and, and what you were talking about, um, having nightmares and, and I've, I've heard of other actors who have, when they've done these roles that are really intense, how much it will affect them. And, and sometimes, um, I, in fact, I had, a, I had a friend that did this really intense short film, or actually it wasn't a short film, but it was an, in, it was an independent film. That was it. And really just the character was brutal. I mean, just, I mean, what he, what he had to go through and it mm-hmm. took him, I remember him saying it took months to be able to get over that particular role because it was so, it affected him so much. And he didn't even realize until after afterwards, how much it affected mm-hmm. him. So uh, I, I think that's probably something that a lot of people don't realize you know they just they just sit there they watch the movie they watch the show it's like okay that character's bad that character oh we don't Mm -hmm. like that character but i think it's 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 true that sometimes those it it's it it, it's it's got to be a challenge for you as an actor you play a part like that and then you know, now you're going to be, now you're going to jump into a comedic role or you're going to jump into something that's completely opposite. And you've just Mm. been playing this character that's, that's really heavy and intense. And, and I, I I can't imagine how that, that probably could affect you. Um, And so Mm. just um, thank you for sharing what you did that again, that you've, You've really been sharing so much, Ryan. We're really getting to, yeah. to see you as a, as a person, as an artist. We're really starting to understand you. So yeah, thanks for thanks for being so open. I I, I really appreciate that, and I'm sure my mm-hmm. my 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 listeners will as well. Um, Great. So you, I don't think you've done a whole lot of um, romantic comedies or that kind of thing. Um, am, am I right on that? Um, not so much in the past. Yeah. Like definitely in my twenties, I was doing a lot more of these, uh, you know, really dark mm-hmm. characters that, uh, you know, were, um, I, yeah, I'm not, it's interesting how that happens, but like actually just within the last year or two, I have been doing quite a few more, uh, light, easygoing rom-coms. I just mm-hmm. shot one, mm-hmm. uh, right before Christmas time called the princess and the bodyguard. Okay. And the trailer just came out uh, last Friday or Thursday. It came out, so it's a it's a it's a really fun trailer. Actually, the editor did a really great job with it. Like it's you know very fun and very comedic. And then uh, with that same company, I'm actually starting a movie tomorrow with them, uh, where I'm also going to be the lead kind of love interest guy in that. And that's also a rom com. Um, and it's called The Mistletoe Match. That that this one's a Christmas one as well. So I'm mm-hmm. sure it'll be coming out probably with the the string of Christmas movies that usually come out on Hallmark. Um, yeah, Mistletoe Match. So I'm really excited to start that tomorrow. Uh, oh. I was running lines before I started uh, this conversation with yeah. you. So I'm like right in the right in the heat of, of getting ready to do it, which is right. exciting. It's always like this this fun little time before, uh, you know, before you actually hit the mark with the other actors where it's, yeah. um, you know, you're building all these ideas in your head and, and trying to see where they're going to sit within you when you actually go to do it. And it's an exciting time, definitely a nerve wracking time. I always get very nervous before the first day of shooting something. Mm-hmm. You know, tonight I probably won't sleep very well, but, um, but with these ones, it's, it's much uh, more fun nerves than like with the, with the darker stuff, mm-hmm. you know, it's like nerves around trying to make comedic moments happen. And like, how do you make a real, like I have a, a young daughter in, in this film who's, you know, whip smart. And it's just, you know, you have the ideas of like, how do you create that, you know, father daughter connection in an authentic way with a, with a young actor, you know, kind of like the day of, or, 
you know, two days before you actually go to shoot the thing. So it's, it's like those kind of anxieties that start to come up. It's just, how do you make it real in so little time? Yeah. Well, yeah. We're normal. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's true because usually these, these rom-coms are shot in what, like 15 days or something like that. Yeah. 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 12 days we're doing these ones. And so it's, yeah, especially for the lead, the lead women. And because most of these movies are, uh, you know, the number one is, 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 is the lead, the lead female that you follow the story through. And it's, their work schedule is absolutely insane on these, you know, they're shooting like Panisse is doing one right now, actually, as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like 18 hour days, some days for, you know, five days straight. And then you kind of do two or two and a half weeks of it. And it's really fast and so much dialogue that you have to kind of get through in a day, you know, on, on, uh, on other projects, most other projects, you're kind of doing, you know, two or three scenes a day type of thing. And I'm sure the women on these films are doing anywhere between, you know, six and 20 on some days. So it's like a total different, uh, uh, schedule than like most actors are put through. I kind of believe that if you can do like the women that are doing these films, if they can do these roles, they can really kind of do anything. Cause that's how challenging I, I believe it is. And most people wouldn't assume that when you watch them just cause they seem like, you know, quite light and fun and cheerful, but it's really a demanding schedule that, that, that the leads are put under, on, under these things. So it's wow. impressive. Wow. Well, and I'm glad, again, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that I've learned is that people think I, I've, I've talked to also another number of actors who, when they do their first Hallmark or rom-com or whatever, whatever it is, and mm -hmm. they think, oh, well, this is going to be really easy. You know, sometimes they had, there is, or, or at least yeah. people have told them, oh, this be easy. This will be really easy. And then they get in and they realize this is not nearly, it's, it's finding, finding the way to, you know, maybe you've done all this dark, heavy stuff in the past and is and lots of action. And then it's like, oh, now you've got to do this nice, sweet story. And it's finding that rhythm because there's that, mm -hmm. that certain way to make things work. I mean, you, you, and, and, and then the people who think that comedy is super easy. Well, we, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I yeah. mean, um because of course you're talking about how to make it do it the comedic timing i mean that is something yeah. that not i the vast majority of people don't come into this world with a knack for comedic timing i realize there are those mm -hmm. ones that probably from you know from the time they entered this world they have it but they <laughs> but mm -hmm. but that's those, those kinds of things are rare. Usually it's something that has to be learned and worked on for years and years and years. So, um, yes. Yeah. yeah. You couldn't be more right about that. Comedy <laughs> is definitely, um, you know, you, you either have it, you're right. You're kind of born with, with that sense of timing, or it takes a long time to understand, uh, how to find it, especially with another actor and to do it, you know, especially with these Hallmark movies, a lot of them ride on, um, you know, just like this, you know, trying to find these authentic moments and like these kind of mythical storylines of love. So it's like, it, it's, it's to find a, a genuine connection and all to be keeping comedic timing and to getting jokes in there that, you know, sometimes exist on the page or, you know, you know, in the script, when I say the page, I'm, I'm meaning the script, but um, that is extremely challenging. Uh, it, it's a lot of hard work, especially when you're doing so many scenes in a day you know if you have time to rehearse prior then it's then it gets a bit easier because you can find these moments with the other actor and the director before having to you know clean it up and make it work for the camera and for you know all the other million things happening on a set and you don't really get that uh, uh that time on these you know it's it's rushed so if you can when you're watching these movies and if, if they're genuinely funny and genuinely heartfelt, that's like some pretty impressive performances that are happening that I think people often don't give credit to these films for, you know, there's a bit of a, I don't know if it's a stigma, definitely within the industry. It's like kind of this thing when you're doing these B C movies, you know, if they're not Oscar worthy nominated mm -hmm. films, people kind of turn their nose down to them. But, uh, you know, I think that they're, like what I was saying before, they're way more challenging to perform in just because of, you know, the budget restrictions that they're often under. And that means that they have to be shot really quickly. And people have to be on their toes. You know, you can't be showing up half asleep to do your first scene because you've got, 
you know, 10 of them to do that day. And if you're slow on that one, then the rest of the day is just going to go to hell. So it's like, you really have to, you really have to be prepared. You have to be ready to do it, you know, and hopefully everyone else is as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you were mainly has been a lot of a character actor who I I just love. I love character actors. I always, I always think that um, if I had been ever going to be an actor, that would have been my choice. It would have been like, I want to be the bad guy in this one. And then, you know, I could be the best friend here and then I can be the person that's dead in the next one, you know, whatever the case is. Um, Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. how different is it when you're doing like character acting, maybe you're in more of a supporting role and then now you're being a lead. Mm. What 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 is the what's the difference in how you prepare in those roles for those roles? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, with the the supporting character roles, um, there's often like I get experience well, but you know, freedom in the performance often. You know, it's like you can you can come in with a bit stronger choices and you can be a bit um, um, more kind of lost in, in what this character's thing is, as long as you're serving kind of whoever the, the leads are, you know, it's like, you're kind of setting them up for certain things, you know, certain moments to lift them up in their main storyline. So being in that role of support for someone else can often be quite freeing for yourself. You know, you don't have to think, uh, you know, you don't have to be pretty, you don't have to be, you know, charming, or, you know, you don't have to be, you know, the prince or the princess, you know, these things that have these large, larger archetypical uh, roles that are kind of based on, you know, Disney movies from way back when and everyone has an idea of what those characters are. So it's like, when you're the leads in these, it's kind of a tighter box to fill into, I find, which can be restricting and, and often more challenging than the character actor where it can be, you know, a bit more loose or free flowing, you know, there's not as much mm-hmm. pressure on you, I think mm-hmm. is, is the biggest thing. So there's a bit more freedom in it. Um, whereas with the leads, with the lead roles, you really have to kind of have a larger sense of uh, your character's role in the entirety of the script. Whereas when I'm playing a character, uh, it's, it's more about each scene. I can break it down into each scene. You know, I don't really have to think so much about how, this scene plays out in the in the longer storyline. Whereas in the lead thing, I really have to be very conscious about where my character is in this part of the story. If they're gonna, you know, it's like in a more serious film where there's, you know, let's say like crying or big emotional kind of dark outbursts, that kind of stuff. The character actor can can do that in most scenes if if the script is warranting it. But if the lead actor is breaking down in every scene just because they want to have that car you know often uh, cathartic actor experience of you know crying and showing that you're like you know emotionally available as an actor it can just weigh down the whole film right it's like you kind of have to pick your moment for when that could happen for your character when you know the door really opens and you really get to see inside of them um it's it can't be in every scene otherwise the film just starts to really drag you know people watch and they're just i think you kind of go oh my god like this actor have to make everything a moment you know Mm -hmm. type of thing so it's like a a, quite a bit more discipline i guess is the word i'm looking for you know you have to be very disciplined as as the lead actors in these um and to really see the whole the whole picture when you're working on each individual scene as you're building the thing you know it can get and you're hoping your director is doing that with you as well. So it can get easy to get lost. And like, especially in these films, these uh, Hallmark and Lifetime films where they're shooting on the, the tighter schedule, you're doing something called block shooting usually, which means you're shooting for locations rather than like shooting in a, in a linear timeline of what the script is. So everything that happens in, you know, the lead's house in the whole movie is shot in the same day. Okay. Mm-hmm. No matter where it is in the, in the script. So if you're going from a scene, you know, on page eight, and then you're jumping to a scene from page 90, and then you're going back to page 60, and that actor is getting kind of pushed through these scenes quite quickly, you know, it's one, two, three takes maybe uh, of a thing, and then you're moving on. It's really easy to kind of get lost and be like, well, where am I emotionally in, in this in this story? What, what has happened to my character right previous to this moment? And you haven't 
you know, shot that moment before either. So you don't necessarily know where your character was right before. So sometimes you're actually having to track yourself backwards, you know, where you're doing the scene. You're like, oh, what did I do after this? So if I was in that state at the top of that scene after this, then I have to backtrack it to, oh, that's where this scene needs to end, actually. So it can get quite complicated and just to make sure that things are lining up, you know, in a, in a, in a truthful way. And, you know, sometimes even the directors are getting confused because it's just, you're just so rushed, right? So yeah. uh, that, that type of stuff is, is definitely the most challenging thing, I think, for the leads on this. Oh, well, well and, I'm, and I'm, again, I'm so glad that you're sharing this because some of these things I've heard, but I've not always heard them explained in the way that you're yeah. explaining them. And you're explaining them in such a way that everybody can understand it. It's not like you're giving a technical definition. You're giving a real definition mm-hmm. in real. So, you know, thank you for doing that again. I mean, man, you're, you're just, you're just help. You're, you're, you're teaching us so much, which is great. I love that. That's, that's one of my favorite things. <laughs> um, is, great. Is, well, I love coming away from these conversations, having learned something. I mean, that's always, you know, it, you know we're mm-hmm. having a conversation, but then I'm learning and, and, and I appreciate that so much. Um, so I know that my my viewers here, my my virtual audience, would love to have to ask some questions. I know Paula, I'm sure you're mm-hmm. already ready to ask a question. All right, hello. Um, I have I, uh, quite a few questions. Um, yeah. You have you have many hats. You have an actor's yeah. hat, a writer's hat, a director's hat, and a producer's hat. If you had to just choose one of them, which one would you like to choose? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, if I was to only in a world where I was only allowed to do one, I think I would. Oh man, that's hard. I would, I would, I would probably, I'd probably still say, oh man. <laughs> uh, I think writing. I think I would I would choose writing, even though in the moment of performance, there's kind of, there's like very few feelings that you'll ever have, you know, I, I or in my experience as you know a person, as you will have kind of losing yourself in the character in front of people, and applause is probably the most addicting thing you'll ever experience to have a crowd applaud you is. Um, you know, I couldn't, I, I, that's the, that's the pinnacle of like human existence in, in my, in my world is, is applause. Um, but there's something about writing that is a more kind of pure expression of maybe what's inside my soul where I get such a greater, um, long-term feedback, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, I think I, at the at the end I had split it into you know my younger self, my younger artist would have would have chose acting uh, first, whereas now as I'm kind of maturing, you know, through life, I, I see a longer run in a, in how I can be like a positive influence on society through through my writing. Hopefully, another thing about writing, the thing that sucks the most about acting is that you're often waiting for someone else to employ you before you can you do your art. So there's so many times in life where you're sitting around, you know, for weeks or months without getting the opportunity to do it besides, you know, hopefully you're auditioning during that time. But auditioning as an artist is an experience, or at least for myself, where it's often, you know, acts of uh, things that are kind of only half fulfilled. You know, you're only half building the character, half getting to express yourself as that character, or half getting to participate in that story. And there's always like a little bit of a residual thing that builds up of you know, how many auditions have I done since I got the last job? And, you know, how long has it been since I acted? And, you know, does anybody even, you know, want me to do this anymore? Should I be doing this? Whereas with writing, you know, I can pick up a pen and a paper whenever I feel the urge to do so. So on a sense of like mental health as an artist, you know, being a writer, I find in comparison is a much more healthy, you know, medium to work in because it's, uh, it's in my control, I guess, whereas acting, 
you know, this job that I'm starting tomorrow could be the last job I ever do for my life, even if I, that's not my choice, you know, it could just go that way, something could happen, you know, um, and I would never get the opportunity to do it again. So I'd have to make peace with that, which would be a hard thing to do. But, you know, writing, I'm always going to be able to do that. So to me, that's, that's, uh, that's a, it's a greater thing. It's like, a, it's more comforting to me, I guess. Did you do it at a young age or did this just come natural to you that you were writing? Did you learn it in school or just automatically came? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I think it, it was natural. I was kind of a lazy student, to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, or like a bit of a class clown. So I was like, I was the kid in class who was often distracting other people. And, um, but still you know, could, you know, phone it in and get good, get good grades. If I had, you know, I was often doing, I was a procrastinator. I was often doing, you know, my assignments the night before and my dad hated it. You know, he would always be like, you could, you have so much opportunity you know, that people are giving you. If you just put in a bit more time and effort, you could be so much, much better than you are. And I was just always, you know, wanting to go out and play in the park rather than, you know, sit down by myself, isolated and write something. So I guess, you know, I was always lucky in that uh, aspect that it came easily to me. But then when I was graduating high school, my dad was uh, diagnosed with cancer. So at that point, I was kind of hit with this real uh, big uh, dilemma, I guess, for lack of a better explanation. But at that point, I started to kind of suffer from insomnia, just like I would have these reoccurring thoughts when I was trying to sleep about my dad dying and you know no longer being there for me and what that would mean for my family and um that type of stuff so I wasn't sleeping very well and then I was in university and my one of my classes that I'd taken was creative writing funny enough and uh, I was kind of sleeping through classes in university it wasn't a big class it was like a it was a niche writing class that was based it was like Canadian history of hockey and there was like mostly all like the u of s husky hockey players were in this class and then like me (laughs) who was like the only like (laughs) non-hockey player in this class like 12 people or whatever and i was like kind of falling asleep in class and the teacher was just this really great uh prof who you know was just taking the time to notice people and he was noticing that i was sleeping in class and i think he liked the things that i was writing so he also got a bit invested in me and you know was telling me you know, we just got talking one day, I think after class, he had held me back because he caught me sleeping in class. And he asked why. And I was just telling him I was having trouble sleeping. And he really, you know, told me to start journaling before bed. You know, these ideas, these thoughts you're having before sleep that are keeping you up, there may be an opportunity for you to get them out of yourself in some helpful way. So that's what I started doing is I just started writing before bed uh, to try and help myself fall asleep and not fixate on, you know, these other things in my life that were keeping me up at night and that's I think really where things started for me and once you're doing that it becomes kind of habitual over time and now it's like when I'm whenever I'm met with a challenge in my life or I'm not feeling great it's just a pen kind of finds my hand it seems like you know it just like shows up somewhere it's like the universe or God just kind of gives me this thing you know it's like it's become uh, a, a part of me in some way and that's kind of how I translate most things is, is usually through poetry first. Like I'll write poetry now uh, rather than journaling. Journaling always felt like a little bit, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, I was like, I just, I, you know, I'd be like making fun of myself as I'm writing. I don't know why it was just like some kind of thing about that. But poetry for me just seems like authentic. Like I can write it. It can go away. I feel better about my day. And then you know sometime later I might pick up that poem again and try and make it better you know and then maybe I'll post it or I'll do something with it eventually but it's kind of just like a pure art form for me which I like. It said that you uh, finished the CBC actors program is that just another form of of schooling or was it just uh, because you just finished it or something that um because you went to film school and television school, but is it a different form? Uh, yeah, so it's it's a really great program. It's out of Toronto, uh, Canada, and it's it's technically the CFC is the school, 
So it's the Canadian Film Centre, and it's kind of basically the highest level of um, film training that you can do in, in Canada, for sure. It'd be something kind of similar to maybe like Juilliard in the States, in New York City, or, uh, you know, or New York Film. Um, so it's a really great program. It says this, the CBC is like our national broadcaster. So it's kind of like public broadcasting, like PBS, what you guys have in the States, but it's, it's fairly well funded here. Like our news is through that and they fund the acting program and, um, and for six months, so they take eight students a year and you apply and you audition for the program. And it's like by far one of the best things I've ever done for myself as an artist was to go into six months off auditioning and just focus on like what I want to do, you know, as a storyteller and have that time away from the industry because industry can be quite toxic over, you know, a long period of time. So it's, I think it's really great for people to take breaks from it and they pay you to go to this school. So it's just like a bursary program, which is so good because usually you'd have to be, you know, working a bartending job or whatever else it is to like support yourself through a program like that. So, and they get some of the best teachers, honestly, in the world. Like we have this lady, um, her name's Lindy Davies, and she's a really great acting teacher, kind of like a world renowned acting teacher from Australia uh, originally. And she comes up to do the program every year and I'd say like, like some of the best teachers in Canada come to this program every year to teach the students. So it's really kind of like a very elite level of training that if you get the opportunity to be a part of, uh, to be a part of it, I would tell any actor to jump at that opportunity. There's nothing better that I've done for myself than that. I, I, I watched your close up. From oh there. yeah. It yeah. is so awesome. And I suggest anybody watching this podcast, if they haven't, to look it up and watch it is very good. You did you did an excellent job, and that's thank always, you. Yeah, and you dedicated it to your dad. Yeah. So, um, so that program, which kind of is interesting yeah. about it, is that at the end of the program, each actor gets to do something called their close up, and that's what this is. It's it was my close up, uh, which is like a short film that you get to write with a writer from the writing department because at the school they have a writers department. They have a, a director's department they have a producing department so you get to make all these really great connections of young industry people coming up with you so it's a really great place to make connections and at the end of the year you get to create your own project and i was going to do and you write it with the writer with a writer that you're matched up with and i was going to do one uh, about a boxer who was losing his hearing because i have done boxing for most of my life and mm -hmm. Um, also connected to, de to the deaf community in another way. So I was really interested in like, you know, how I could tell a story like that of someone losing their hearing, probably because of the thing that they love most because of boxing. Mm. And we were writing this thing out. And then my dad actually ended up passing away while I was at the school doing the program, kind of like a month before. And so I had to fly home and it was right before Christmas. And I didn't get to be at the school for that month where we were, were creating these stories. And I'd fallen behind in that. And the writer who I was matched up with actually got a job writing for, or no, he, he was an actor as well. And he got a job on the show called Orphan Black, which was like a very famous kind of show shooting up in Canada for a while. And it won lots of Tati Maslany, who was a Saskatchewan actress. She won, you know, a crap ton of awards for that show. But anyways, long story short, uh, when I was coming back to finish the program, uh, I wanted a certain director to direct a short that I had written about the boxer and the school <laughs> wouldn't approve this director because the director hadn't gone through the directing program at the school. So we got in a bit of a tiff over the whole thing. And I was kind of given an ultimatum of like, well, do you want to do one or not? And uh, that night I just sat down and I wrote that script, the one that yeah, it ended up being uh, that we shot. That's, you know, kind of a, about a therapy session about a, young man grieving the death of his father and obviously is like pretty similar to what was actually happening for me at that a moment and was maybe more of a documentary than an actual uh you know fictional film but yeah panisa is actually in that film she's the nurse that comes in at the end of it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so i cast it close to home too yeah but yeah thank you for that that's really wonderful you to say that you like that beautiful it was beautifully done thank you mm -hmm. and it, my my um 
a grandson has a girlfriend who's studying film and acting and oh. she just made she just did her short and it Great. was about an artist that went blind oh wow yeah it was real yeah yeah so well That's my last good. question because i'm sure someone else wants to, I know you yeah. want to say it. um every movie has the star mm -hmm. and the and the main actor and everything but i have to tell you the memory mm -hmm. book Mm -hmm. is oh, yeah. I watch it twice a month oh, because great. I'm still looking for that memory person like the book and your scenes the the, the book is what made the story oh, yeah. and you oh, played young Jonathan and, yeah. and young Sarah and it just was yeah. so awesome did did you get to did you get to see or how did you get chosen for that for that role um yeah, that's a good, I think that one I actually was offered uh, that role at the time because it's like, it's funny, like in the acting industry, there's like a whole a hierarchy of like, you know, trying to move up. So you stop taking roles that are like, you know, only a certain amount of lines, like within the union, there's different classifications. So like your agent is always trying to go, no, you're not going to do a non-speaking role anymore. You're not going to do, you know, a you know, what's called a principal role anymore or an actor role, you know, now that you're a lead actor, you only do lead roles type of thing. And uh, I got that because that audition, I think it was, there wasn't, maybe they created the scene, but like most of what happened in the script, my character didn't have any dialogue, right? It's all like, yeah, it's all flashback stuff photos. with me and yeah, young Sarah, like recreating those photos, right? And I think they, they must've had a hard time finding someone who really looked like, uh, like the actor who I think is Art, what's his name? He's a Hindle. Canadian actor. Hindle? Yeah, Hindle. yeah, Art Hindle, who's, yeah, uh, yeah, I have obviously a physical resemblance to. <laughs> so the casting director, you know, must have thought of me just because, oh, I know an actor who looks like Art. And that casting director and I got along quite well in Vancouver. So, and she was really great. You know, she would look out, look out for me as an actor and try and get me opportunities. And uh, yeah, I guess when I got offered it, it you know, my agent was like, here's this thing you got offered. It's great to have an offer, but you know, it's, there's no lines in it. So if you want to pass, you can pass. And I just remember reading it and it kind of reminded me, you know, obviously of like the notebook, which is, you know, an iconic, great movie. And I thought there was a lot of great heart in it and the other actors who were involved with the, in, with the project were good actors. So I knew it'd probably be a good, a good film because of that, that would, you know, some of these films, they get viewed once and no one ever views them again. Right. There's like so many of them that pop up on TV, but this one I thought could have a bit of longer legs and it would just be a fun day of shooting. You know, it's like, why not go and act if you get the opportunity to? So, and like the actress who played Sarah, she's really fun, you know, very, uh, you know, bubbling, quite a pure soul. So it's like, we had a lot of fun doing, doing that. Yeah. It was, yeah, but that's how it came to be. I just got the, it off. The first. book was the story. I mean, that's yeah. what the whole story was about, the characters. And mm -hmm. I, I take photos, and the photography in there was so excellent. It was so yeah. good. And that, so yeah. I really enjoyed that. Well, thank you very much for answering my questions. Yes, thank you, Paula. Very good questions. You've done your homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She does. So, she does. She does. Good. All right. So... My mom is now going to come on here. Okay. Hi. Hi, Ryan. So nice to meet you. So enjoyed what you were sharing. It just uh, two, two comments. Um, mm -hmm. I really believe you have an absolutely amazing future ahead of you because you draw people into your conversation. I mean, it's not like, yeah, I'm sitting, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away if you're looking on, on, on these computer screens, but it, you drew me in and it was just like I was sitting over a cup of coffee, you know, having a cup of coffee yeah. and we're just sharing yeah. across the table. And so Great. that, that to me is a mark of a fantastic mm -hmm. actor. And wow. uh, I just, I just really appreciated that and all the, the insight that you gave and, and things that we learned about what went on behind the scenes, because I, I'm not like my daughter as far as, as remembering this person and that person and this role and mm -hmm. that role. And it's like, there has to be something that just really 
hits me for me to remember this person. And and you yeah. shared something in your story that I will always remember. And Ruth will only have mm. to say that say the word hey, and I'm going to remember who she's talking about because I, I too grew up on a farm. And my yeah. the one season, the only part of a farming that I loved was during the haying season. Mm-hmm. And it was so when you were talking about that, it brought back some just really fond memories of being with my dad. And uh, yeah. it just I, I, I miss even to this day so much. Uh, and it's just uh, so I will always remember that. And I just thank you. It was a fantastic interview. I just really enjoyed it. And I look forward to seeing seeing your work and uh, more of yeah. your I, I must. Com- I remember the title of every book. I remember pieces of it. But I'm now I'm going to I'm going to have to go check it out again. I'm going to have to watch it again because it really got my curiosity up. And you just uh, really a tremendous, tremendous person inside you. And that's what came out. And I just want to thank you for that. I just really enjoyed enjoyed listening to all, all that you had to share and look forward to to a great, great, great movies and, and times of entertaining ahead. So thank you. Thank you, Mom. That's, uh, yeah, very nice of you to say. All those things were, hit, hit me deep. Yeah, thank you. That's good. That's good. So go ahead, Tammy. Hey, Ruth. Thank you. Hi, Ryan. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Likewise. Hi. So I have a couple of little quick questions. Um, I am in the process right now of writing a book. I've never, mm. never done that before. I never even... Mm-hmm kind of really thought that I would do that. Um, so my book that I'm writing is actually going to be on um, the the grieving of losing a pet. So, and it's going to be on the process of um, how we get a pet, we raise it, we mm-hmm. bond, we go through things with life and then we lose them. But then the guilt of what it's like mm-hmm. when we lose and think you know on and on like that and Mm -hmm. so I've actually have gotten it almost completed um and I'm very good for you yeah it's um so it's been about a four-year making I actually had a dog that I had for 14 and a half years that I lost that was very he was my first pet that I ever lost and that I actually had to put to sleep so it was a lot of the, the guilt um so it's something that I've been wanting to do but I've always like just kind of held myself back and I'm finally like, mm-hmm. there's no need to hold myself back. Like anybody can write a book. So why can't I, you know? Yes, 100%. And so I, um, so I guess my question to you is, is now that I'm getting close to the end of it, mm-hmm. one of the things I want to like, one of the things that is intimidate me a little bit is like where to go to next, like who to get to mm-hmm. edit it, who to get to publish it. That part mm-hmm. of what, really scare me and I'm trying to overcome that so it doesn't hold me back and then part two to my question for you is listening to what you were saying was is that you know I'm I took drama in school and I've always been into like the plays and the movies and things like the all of that I've always been interested in but as I've gotten older too one of the things that I love to do is I can see things I can envision like plots and storylines and things like Mm -hmm. that so in in that sense where would you go if you had ideas of say hey, I think this would make a great script or, hey, how about like mm-hmm. how we put this together? Like what would the got like what would the advice that you would have to give to someone who might doesn't want to be in front of the camera, but mm-hmm. wants to be the time working on putting stuff to get together? Yeah, great question. So are uh, both questions. So the book uh, st- and, and they're both kind of related. So mm-hmm kind of what I hear you're saying is what you like right now you're working in something that's kind of like I refer to as like a bubble so it's like it's kind of it just feels like it's you uh working with yourself um mm-hmm. and I find that experience is you know often quite isolating and lonely and you know COVID has also been that for us as well so it's kind of like a double down of that thing but you know what I'm trying to do always is trying to find a bit of a community to work with um mm-hmm. so 
I think of the, it really just starts with talking with people, you know, telling them that you're doing this. I'm sure there's a lot of people in your life that probably don't even know you've written, been writing this book for four years, you know, and there's a lot of people in your life that want to support you and love you and, and want to be a part of that story. And maybe at first they're going to, you know, kind of act a little uh, thrown off by it, obviously, because it's like, well, why didn't you tell us you're writing this? And I'm sure it's probably because it's a, quite a personal, emotional story and you know, you might feel as a writer that you're revealing things about yourself in that story as well that are, uh, you know, big things for yourself. So there's nervousness around that. Um, but I think like the biggest thing to to tell you would would be that like everybody wants to everybody wants to express themselves. You know, everybody wants to be known better. And we often in life are stuck on these very surface conversations that are just like you know about the weather, or, you know, what you have for dinner, or, you know, what's your weekend going to be. But I think everyone craves deeper conversations. So I, you don't have to fear, you know, telling people about these bigger things you're wanting to do. And once you start talking about them, you're going to find other people around you that also have the same wants and aspirations that you do and that you can maybe work together with. You know, if you see the storyline, you're probably there's someone in your community that probably has a dream of shooting a short film. So then you can collaborate with them in that capacity. Uh, to break into like the larger industry, it's mm -hmm. often like usually it's just like really you know who you know a lot of the time, or and that's like the fastest way to break in. You know, you know some producer, or you have some cousin who's friends with producer in in Hollywood, and then they'll try and get it. But that's, um, you know, for lack of a better term, like moonshot type thing, like just pure luck coincidence. You know, where I think like at the state that you're at, it might be good to look around what kind of educational programs are already set up around you you know a writing class where you can take this project to and there's other people that are going to be being bringing projects to that as well and you would be paying you know the class to help you workshop your story and you would also be helping them workshop their stories mm -hmm. so like educational communities or schools are often great places to build those relationships because you're also on the same level as those other people you know having an approach you know a business where you feel like you know you may not be qualified yet to get there you can start in a much more simple place i think of just finding a community of like-minded people that are all wanting the same things as you um publishing like the easiest thing to do is self-publish there's like a number of companies that you can google online i, I know freezing press is one um that they're quite good who you can publish with i think it's like you know three thousand bucks and you know they'll help you like do your cover design and all that stuff and i think you can even get an editor through them so that you'd be paying paying them to help you with that process um but i would also tell like from writing you know or trying to write my own books and get into certain stages of them uh you know i think like for any book before it's probably you want to make sure to go out to people and I always think that it's like, it's never ready until it's kind of like five or 10 drafts that I've done from kind of beginning to finish where you've actually like, you know, broken it apart and rebuilt it and like found a gleaming error and solved it and then had to go back and backtrack. Oh, this actually has to change because that one thing changed. So, you know, you really want to make sure you've kind of done your due diligence before setting it out, especially if this is your first thing that people are reading of yours. You know, it's not like you have some other you know, and I'm just assuming here is you don't have another great piece of work that you're that people already know that you've done, you know, and it's with your work, it's almost like a first impression as well as like a personal first impression. So it's like you want that to be strong, you know, and it, I don't think it's about I think it's about not rushing that as well. And maybe finding someone who's like really you know, I have people in my life who I'm quite close with who get, you know, they get to have the first read of things that I write because I know that I can trust them. And even if it's not quite ready yet, they'll still be gracious with their notes or feedback. You know, they'll like take into care of my sensitivities as an artist because they're often artists as well, you know, so they know, you know, the right way to kind of say, yeah, it's, it's good. There's good heart in it. You know, you just got to fix this, that, another thing kind of thing. So, so. I think it really comes down to finding a community of people that you can trust to uh, to hold your heart when you give it to them, because <laughs> that's probably what it's going to feel like. Yes. Well, well, very good. Thank you so much for the advice. I really appreciate that.
Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Good luck with it. It's it's that's a big endeavor you took on, and congratulations on getting you know getting close to finishing. And now that's a big thing. Thank you. Yeah, it's um it's something that I um definitely as I as I sit down, I definitely can tell that as as you write, it's um you know it's it's one of those things as I'm writing that my like I can just like sometimes it just feels like my heart wants to explode just like from mm-hmm. the things I'm trying to put on the paper. So I feel like mm-hmm. a very connection to it. So that alone makes me feel like that I'm doing the right thing by doing it. So wow. Oh well those, thank you. I agree. Well, well, It'll thank be for you, you first and then yeah. through the drafts you figure out how to make it for other people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, thank you, Tammy. That was awesome. That was really a great way to even wrap things up. Uh, Ryan, that, you know, you know, a lot of stuff you have been, you have shared so much with us during this time. I can't even thank you enough. I've, I have learned so much about so many things. I loved your whole perspective. So, you know, thank you. And thank you, Tammy, for asking. That was, that was brave of you to ask. That's mm-hmm. true courage. So th- thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right. Well, um, as we're closing, wrapping things up, if you guys do want to unmute and thank Brian for being here, um, you know, if you want to express your gratitude to him, feel free. Thank you so much. I did see the trailer to the, uh, the new one, the princess and the bodyguard. It looks awesome. It Great. Really Glad you like it. Yeah. yeah. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. yeah good. Brian, thank you. And best wishes for everything for you. Yes, thank you. Good luck. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ryan, for being here. It's been a joy. Um, I, I have a feeling we're going to have to have you back at some point because we just started this conversation right. and we could have kept going for a long, long time. So thank you yeah. so much. I have learned so much and I've so appreciated it. And uh, we are look forward to all of your works coming up. It's, it's going to be exciting. So yeah. Good, good luck yes, tomorrow. Appreciate it, Ruth. Good luck tomorrow. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. First all day, right. first day. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys and have a great Thank rest you. of your day. All right. Bye bye. Yes, you bye-bye. too. Bye. Bye I really have to thank Ryan Bruce and my incredible virtual audience. This was such an engaging conversation. But I also don't want to forget to thank Honey Sade. Without her, Ryan would not have been here. Um she had such good things to say about me that he said oh yeah of course i'll come and be on your show so how cool is that so i I do love things like that and so i'm grateful so thank you pennies i mean they're such a amazing two two amazing individuals who i've been so privileged to have on my show and hope to have them back again soon but i just am so grateful that we can have these kinds of conversations where it becomes a family and we can have honest conversations about so many different things. We never know what direction we're going to go. Mistletoe Match is not going to make it this year for the U.S., but it is going to be on City TV in Canada, so I will have all that information posted. So make sure you look it up. If you're in Canada, you're going to get a chance to see him. If not, if you happen to be elsewhere, look up his works lots of stuff out there whether it's a memory book whether it's republic of sarah whatever it might be i invite you to look this young man up and i can hardly wait to see what the future holds for him but i just want to thank all of you for being here without you my podcast media from the heart would not exist And I thank you all for your continued support. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please rate, review, subscribe. That'd be be awesome. If you're watching on YouTube, thumbs up, subscribe, please. It'd be awesome. And just be sure you join my Facebook group so that you can come on one of these episodes. I know not everybody can because of work schedules. I understand that. Um, But there are some coming up that you might be able to attend. So just... Pay attention because I'd love to have lots of you come. My vision is to have this to be a huge group of individuals that comes. That before long we we have 50 coming regularly. I'd love that. And then getting over 100. I would love that. 
But till that, but 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 you know what? It's not about quantity as much as it's quality. And the beautiful thing is, this community is so amazing. So I just want you guys to be able to have the freedom to come and feel like you were a part of something special because this is. Time and again, I hear from our from my guests and really our guests how much they love the experience and how much it meant to them. So thank you all for being awesome. I pray that you have a blessed day and go do something for yourself. God bless.